Hey everyone, it's time for Good Week Israel, where we'll bring you the most positive highlights from this week at ILTV. Get ready to smile because coming up, excavations in Jerusalem reveal a more modern part of Israeli history in one of the most ancient of places. We'll hear about an incredible discovery of an ancient ritual bath, and the world's first smart air-conditioned bus station was posted in Israel's southernmost city of Eilat. Even archaeologists were stumped by this next story, but not because of how old the discovery was. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Check it out. History is all around us, especially in Israel and even more so in Jerusalem. But not all new discoveries are necessarily ancient. The Western Wall Heritage Foundation and Israel Antiquities archaeologists showing off their latest excavations of a Jordanian munitions stash hidden under the lobby of the Western Wall tunnels. The find dates back to the 1967 Six-Day War between Israel and Jordan, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. And the stash was discovered by accident while excavating a water cistern. Excavators explained that apparently this is an ammunition dump that was purposely hidden by soldiers of the Royal Jordanian Army during the Six Day War, perhaps when the IDF liberated the old city. An incredible discovery of an ancient Second Temple period ritual bath was made in the Galilee. And ILTV got to hear all about it from Anat Harel. Check out this interview. Now Israel might be tiny geographically, but in almost every inch of sand there's a story. And we see it often when building new sites in the country because first the ground needs to be cleared and it's often that something remarkable is uncovered in the process. Now this story is incredible. About two weeks ago, workers building a new road near a Kibbutz Hanaton in the Lower Galilee stumbled upon an amazing discovery from ancient times. And one of the residents from that Kibbutz happens to be an Israeli tour guide and archaeology enthusiast and Anat Harel joins us from the exact spot where the, the, the discovery was made. Anat, tell us what did the workers find? Hi. So what happened was is that um, we have to build a new bridge and they're moving the highway over. And so when they started to move the highway over, they realized that they were discovering some kind of an agricultural farm. And as they excavated only about two to three weeks ago, they came upon an amazing discovery. They found a mikveh, which is a ritual immersion pool. And as they were excavating, they discovered that the plaster in the mikveh was the same plaster that we used in Second Temple times. Second Temple times, we're talking before the destruction of the Second Temple. We are talking 2,000 years ago. And this makes this particular immersion pool amazing. And, and how can you tell that it's from the Second Temple period? Show us, show us a bit of the mikveh, because you're standing right there. Let's have a look at it. Yes. So what happens is we, what we see here is an, an agricultural farm. We thought it was from Byzantine times, but as they excavated er, lower and lower, they realized that this was also from early Roman times. And do you see the mikveh? I, t I right can. There? Wow, it's incredible. Yeah, and so what a mikveh is, it's an immersion pool, and you see the steps, there are steps going down, and apparently this was a mikveh for the farmers that worked either in the olive oil industry or the wine industry. And the reason they know it is from Second Temple times is because the plaster, the plaster on the walls of the mikveh has a gray color to it, which is exactly what Second Temple time ritual baths were made of. The plaster was gray. Later on in Byzantine times, apparently the plaster improved and it was white instead of gray. And that's how the archaeologists know that it is from before the destruction of the Second Temple. And so, Anad, I understand, of course, it's an amazing discovery and you live in the kibbutz right near where it was found. I understand that you wanted to get a replica of the mikveh made, but you were actually surprised to get something else. What was that? 
Well, okay, so um, I live in Kibbutz Hanaton, which is only like half a mile away. When the um, Antiquities Authority found this mikveh, they actually invited, they invited all the public to come. They had several tours around here. And when the archaeologist explained that this is a mikveh from Second Temple times, we got really excited because I am on the mikveh committee in my kibbutz. <laughs> and we said to the archaeologist, hey, why don't we make a replica of this 2,000-year-old mikveh and put it right next to our brand new mikveh? And he said, why build a replica? Why don't we raise money and excavate this mikveh out and we'll transplant the whole real 2,000-year-old mikveh That's and amazing. put it in your kibbutz. That is yeah. incredible. And very briefly, before we have to let you go, I understand this has become quite the cross-cultural production. Tell us a little bit about that. So what's uh, another thing that's amazing is that in the Antiquities Authority, many of the archaeologists are Israeli Arabs. The archaeologist who found this Jewish mikveh is an Israeli Arab archaeologist. And these archaeologists that told me, let's transplant it, is also an Israeli Arab archaeologist trying to save a Jewish mikveh. That's the kind of coexistence we have in the Galilee. That's why I love living here. That is beautiful, and I share in your enthusiasm. And thank you so much for taking us right to the site that it was found just two weeks ago. Thank you. You are welcome. Now, we might be able to blast into space, but it's taking some time to work out how to help commuters get from central Israel to Eilat. But in one small step for man and one giant leap towards the approval of a train line, this could be just the solution fed-up travelers are looking for. It's Israel's most famous resort town, and for years, millions of locals and tourists have been waiting for a better way to travel south to Eilat. Without a personal vehicle, your choices are between the limited, long and crowded bus trips or catching a flight. But after nearly a decade since approving the initiative, Israeli government planners are getting started on a train line. Now, the first section of the line will connect Beersheva to Mishor Rotem via Dimona at a cost of 2.7 billion shekels, that's more than $780 million. Planners estimate that by 2030, between 18 and 30 trains per day will travel to the southernmost Israeli city, carrying 5.2 million passengers and hundreds of thousands of containers of cargo a year. There could be some obstacles though, since the budget is yet to be approved. Plus, don't forget the environment. Potential damage to the desert landscape also needs to be assessed. Don't you just hate it when you're waiting for a bus and it's sweltering outside? Well, this next Israeli trial may just be able to solve this problem, and Tracy Alexander has all the details. Typically the best part of waiting for the bus, standing in the warm Israeli sunshine. That's until the peak of summer when the fun is over, and temperatures in the south soar to around 40 degrees Celsius or 105 Fahrenheit. Thankfully, at least one station is offering reprieve. Say hello to the world's first smart air-conditioned bus station. Placed in Israel's southernmost tourist hub of Eilat, the station serving as a pilot for the rest of the country. It boasts automatic sliding doors with interactive signage and a touchscreen. A comfortable inside temp of around 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, a bus travel smart card charging station and an electronic bulletin board with information on relevant bus lines. It's also set with a number of CCTV cameras with staff watching 24-7. Each station coming at a cost of roughly 160,000 shekels or $46,000. And now let's take a look at an ILTV interview with an international photographer that captures shots of soldiers for their families. All right, now I'm really excited for this next story. The coronavirus pandemic has affected the lives of all of us, including IDF soldiers who have not met their families for weeks. But a surprise encounter in the Negev Desert's flower fields between soldiers and international photographer Igal Slavin has led the talented photographer to volunteer, bringing photographic smiles and greetings back to the parents and family. Joining us with the gorgeous details is Igal himself. Igal, thank you so much for being with us. Now, how did your relationship with the soldiers you know, begin? First of all, it's my pleasure, and uh, it's uh, really interesting to hear what you said uh, right now. Listen, our soldiers are, uh, you know, they are brave. Our, uh, our uh, boys, our girls, they're amazing. They are doing uh, amazing. Um, and uh, look at them. <laughs> what can I say? One uh, photo, you know, it's uh, 1,000 awards. 
Um, this period of time of the coronavirus, you know, I'm leading uh, groups of uh, photographers for uh, cultural photography around the world. So now uh, there is uh, the virus and I'm, I'm here in Israel. And I, I thought about, you know, how to make with my uh, camera, with pictures, you know, how to make uh, our uh, IDF soldiers proud, how to make uh, the parents proud that uh, they can't see, you know, the children one month, one and a half months, even two months, they are not um, coming to, the, to, to their houses, you know, they are in the army. So I thought about how to bring uh, the pictures from the soldiers to uh, the mother, to the father, to the parents. Yeah, to the how, how are the girl parents girl. reacting? Listen, I went to the south, to, to south of Israel, and I met these amazing uh, soldiers, you know, uh, during uh, sunrise, uh, doing their job. I uh, talked with them. They said I, uh, we, we, we weren't home two months. And I uh, sent the pictures to the parents. They were, you know, they were amazed. It was really uh, surprised, first of all. They wrote me amazing things that, um, you know, this is amazing surprise to see their boys, their uh, girls, the soldiers uh, during, uh, you know, this amazing thing that they are doing. So For me, you know, look, look at that. Look at the pictures, yeah. you know. Yeah, I was just, so <laughs> just going to ask you, you know, because these photos are amazing. So which one, I know it'll be hard to pick, which one is your favorite? There is one unique picture that I really love that uh, I uh, shot um, uh, during uh, a journey of Golani. This is the picture. You know, they are, they are giving the soldiers um, the, the Bible, you know. Um, yeah. And when I came and I saw uh, the Quran and the Bible, and uh, uh, it, was, it was, for me, it was really amazing. I, I think that uh, our army is so unique to see everybody in uh, one army doing amazing uh, work together, you know? Mm. So, Absolutely. You know, uh, right. well, well, together, you got this is... Uh, well, I, got, I, ju I just want to thank you so much because these pictures are incredible. It was a pleasure to look through them earlier and, and even more so to hear you talking pleasure. about them. If, if people watching at home, if you want to see more of these amazing photos and other photos from Igal's work, uh, you can check them out on Instagram at Igal Slavin 1212. Igal, thank you so thank much for being with us. My pleasure. Israel's official Twitter page is having a bit of fun with its followers, asking people to join a conversation around which country's users would like to see Israel strengthen ties with. And the social media managers are having some fun with the responses. Take a look. An incredible Israeli charity organization is sending Israeli girls to camp. And ILTV got to sit down with Shalom Zaidel to hear all about this initiative. Check this out. Well, summer is coming and not all children will be able to go to camp. And this has nothing to do with COVID-19. It's because not every family can afford it. So the charity organization Yad Ezra Veshulamit decided to open a free summer camp in Jerusalem for some 80 girls whose parents don't have the extra funds. And to hear a little more about the initiative, Shalom Zidel is joining me in the studio. Shalom, great to have you with us. Thank you, Tracy. Now tell us a little bit about it. Why was it important for you to fund uh, the summer camp for these girls? Because part of our reasoning, Tracy, has always been 
not only just to feed the children, which of course is our primary objective, but to look to take a holistic approach to everything. Mm -hmm. So we want these kids to have fun. We want these kids to get out of their home environment, which very often is very crowded, doesn't have the computers, doesn't have many other games that most other kids have. Mm -hmm. They're really kids from really difficult backgrounds. So what kind of activities are they able to get involved with at the camp? All right, so we have swimming for them, we have other outings, we have amusement parks. We really want to take them out for five weeks, give them a real life to show them that it's not just difficult times, especially now. You know, the poor were here before COVID, yeah. the poor continue to be here after right. COVID-19, and we're there to say to, to these kids and their families, you're going to have a great time for the next five weeks. And they really get to be a part of it without paying anything at all. How do you finance it? We finance it through donations <laughs> okay. of, of the public, both in Israel and, and mm -hmm. the rest of the world. And uh, this is for 80 children, 80 girls between 6 and 12. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost about $35,000, and uh, through our website, we hope that people will listen to what we have to say and <laughs> donate. It's $435 per child. Wow. And even if people do it together, it would be lovely. Certainly. So each donation, each time you get to that total amount, it sends another girl to the summer camp. Absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. And so what kind of responses do you get from either the parents or the children that have attended these camps in the, in the years before? The, the parents are so grateful. We've got all kinds of letters from, from, from the parents who say that their girls have had a wonderful time. Mm. They've really experienced things they've never had in their lives before, honestly. It's that, you know, desperate a situation. So give us an, an idea as to kind of what backgrounds these, these kids are coming from, to give us an idea as to what kind of an opportunity it really is for them. I've seen some terrible, horrible stories, honestly. Um, people who, who've either one parent families, one parent has been lost to COVID or to other things previously. Mm. Um, obviously divorce, one parent families. Mm -hmm. One of them is very sick, has an operation. And once all those things happen, their lives are, are tremendously impacted. So if we can take them out of that environment for those few weeks and right. give them a real fantastic time, provide them two meals every day. Beautiful. And infuse some positivity and joy in their life as kids, all kids should have. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for bringing us that insight, Shalom. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Israeli performers are taking to the streets as they try to keep the vibe alive while theaters remain closed. Aaron Porras has the story. Let's take this outside. Israeli dance troops are moving out of the studio spaces and into the great outdoors. Since permission hasn't quite been granted for theaters and performance spaces to open their doors, several troops are taking their performances into the open spaces, where social distancing can be kept and masks can stay on more comfortably. In the courtyard of Tel Aviv's Suzanne Delal Center, dance troupe Vertigo will perform their iconic work, Birth of the Phoenix, on June 30 and July 1. Jerusalem's Khan Theater will perform Under the Open Skies in July and August, with some of the theater's most beloved plays put up in the Ben Chinom Valley. And unplugged on the patio by the Jerusalem Arts Center, Beit Hansen, you can catch trumpeter Avishai Cohen, Tomer Yosef, Neta El Kayam, Rif Cohen, and Shai Tzabari in a summer of outdoor musical events. And now it's time for an entertainment rundown with Emmanuel Kadosh. Take a look. Now, I find Israelis entertaining altogether, and those are just my friends and the people I meet on the street. So it goes without saying that the entertainment industry here is dishing up a smorgasbord of fun. And to bring us up to speed with all things entertainment and culture, I'm joined by our very own Emmanuel Kadosh. Emmanuel, what have you got for us today? Hey, Tracy. So I'm just going to jump straight into it because there is a lot to cover. ABC has a officially canceled the Israeli adaptation of The Baker and the Beauty TV show just after its first season. Now, the romantic comedy drama show was nixed just after its nine-episode freshman run. And fans and celebrities across America were simply not having it. A Save the Show campaign with a petition has been, has been trending and has already racked up more than 130,000 signatures in an effort to get another network to pick it up. Whoa, that is such a shame. It was such a huge hit here in Israel. It's such a pity that it didn't go the same way in the United States. So did the show just not have good enough ratings or was there another reason for the cancellation? So according to reports, the show had a quote, tough time connecting with viewers, getting less than 3 million views a week, even though it was thought to be a good programming fit during the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, after all, what else were, were people mm -hmm. doing other than binge watching TV shows? Mm -hmm. But either way, the show didn't get the viewership that ABC had anticipated, ultimately leading to its cancellation. But there are actually two interesting things here. The first is that the Israeli version of the show was one of the highest rated scripted series ever in Israeli TV history, which I can attest to. It's definitely one of my favorite shows to date. 
Amazing. But I also heard that there is a lot of backlash actually coming right. from the Latino community there due exactly. to the, the cancellation, right? Yeah, that leads me to the second interesting factor, you could say. The star of The Baker and the Beauty, Natalie Kelly, spoke out recently about the cancellation, stating that a show with a Latino cast is, quote, necessary during these times, and that, quote, ABC has made an extremely tone-deaf decision at a time when the public is marching in the streets, demanding representation and diversity. Oh, well, hopefully another the network sees the opportunity in this I show and so. picks up the series for another season. All right, what's next? All right, so up next, shockingly enough, the coronavirus has been able to do what no war, natural disaster, or any other crisis has done for more than 50 years. And that is, are you ready? <laughs> to put a halt <laughs> on the stage performances of Fiddler on the Roof. That is not where I thought you were going with that. What? I can't even get my head around it. What even is the world without Fiddler on the Roof? I agree. I agree. When I read this news, I was shocked, just like you. But <laughs> apparently, the last show of the North American tour of Fiddler was actually at Detroit's Fisher, which was the same venue that the show was performed for the very first time back in 1964. Mm -hmm. The musical has been a beloved part of American musical theater since its debut 56 years ago and has been performed all over the globe, even in places where Jewish culture is virtually or completely non-existent. Wow, and I can actually tell you that family members of mine have performed in the Australian production. Wow. Not, not the, uh, the national production. It was a school production, but nonetheless, so, it's part of it's the family. It's getting represented. The <laughs> and now, I understand there might be a new Fiddler on the Roof film. Any right. truth to that? Right. So from what I've read, that seems to be the case. MGM is set to produce a remake of the iconic musical about the struggles and joys of Jewish life and will be carrying on many traditions. The original movie version of Fiddler came out in 1971 and actually racked up three Oscars. Wow, well, I am definitely looking forward to seeing this new remake of the film. Me too. Thank you for the update, Emmanuel. Of course. Well, that's all for today's Good Week Israel. I hope we've helped you start your week off with a smile. I'm Nittany Manson, and I'll see you next week.